Today we are going to learn about Mishkanak Eternity. Specifically, we're going to learn about the boards of the Mishkan, or that which was used to create the scrimmage, or the space, the hallowed sacred space, which was the traveling tabernacle that housed the presence of God. The fourth reading begins with chapter 26, the 15th verse, Ve'asisa, Es HaKroshen, you shall make or fashion the boards, La Mishkan, for the Mishkan. What will you do? There will be Atze Shitim, they will be made of acacia wood, and there will be Oimdim, they will be standing. Let's take a look at Rashi for starters. The Asisa Es HaKroshen, you will make or fashion these boards of wood, says Rashi. The verse should have read, You'll make boards. Instead it says, You will make the boards. The boards? What, like This is like boards we talked about already? Why does it have a S? There's a, there's a S and then there's an, a hey. It's a very definitive article. You'll make the boards, make the walls. Why? Why? What, what makes this definitive? And you'll say, well, that's what it says. It says, Vyasisa es Haron, es Hamnora. So Rashi says, no, it doesn't say that actually. It says, Vyasisa Aron. It doesn't say, Vyasisa Ha Shulchan, it says, Vyasisa Shulchan. It doesn't say, Vyasisa Ha Menora, it says, Vyasisa Menora Zav. Kemoisha Nema, Bechol Dover Vedover, the same way that it says it with regard to everything else. Mahu, what then is the meaning of Hakrashim? The, there's this emphasis. As if we know about this already, we've heard this, we've seen this. It says Rashi, We're speaking here about the material that's been designated for it. It's waiting in the wings, so to speak. This has been prepared. It's oimdim, it's, it's standing ready. How could it be standing ready? There was no Mishkan. We just got a command for the Mishkan now. This is the commandment. So Rashi says, this has everything to do with the past Jewish history. Yankev of Vinu, our father Jacob, he was able to prophetically foresee that the Jewish people would have to build a Mishkan, a traveling tabernacle, and that they would need these acacia wood. So, Nota Arozim Bimitzrayim, when our father Jacob arrived in the land of Egypt, he planted trees. Uchashemes, and when he passed, in his last will and testament, he included Tziva Levanov Laha Aloisam. He instructed his children to make sure that when you will leave, you take the wood with you. Take these trees. Harvest these trees and take the lumber. He said to them, He didn't just make a commandment like out of the blue. He says, oh, you know, just take the wood. Don't ask me what it's about. He said, no, no, you will need it. God is going to command you. You're going to have to build a tabernacle some kind of structure that will house the presence of God. And you'll have to do it in the Midbar and you'll have to use Atzei Shittim. So he says, since you're going to get a commandment like that, Re'u she'yiyu mizumanim v'yadchan. Make sure when the command comes, you will be ready. You'll have the material. And that's what, that's what happened. Now, here Rashi tells us something very interesting. He leans on a liturgical poem, a prayer, which is actually recited in many communities, in many, many Ashkenazi communities, on the first day of Pesach. Vahusha Yisaid, this is the foundation of the liturgical prayer, it's called a Yoitzer, that was written for the first day of Pesach. Rashi calls him Yisad Habavli, the Babylonian. The Babylonian Rashi, Rashi mentions actually this python three times. He sometimes calls him um, Habavli, uh, Rabbi Nushleima, sometimes he calls him Habavli. His better known, his full name is Rabbeinu Shleimah HaKotan Rabbi Yehudi HaBavli. He was a humble man. He considered himself a minor. Rabbi Solomon, the, the, the small one, the son of Yehuda who came from Bavel. He actually lived in Italy. And this Italian sage was a profusive writer. He wrote many, many of the piyutim. In fact, I think there are four or five of the prayers that we say in our Slichot prayers that were authored by the Bavli, by Rabbeinu Shleimah. So Rabbeinu Shleimah known as the Bavli, writes in his piyut, 
This is the only piyot which was said like during the year, during the, the not not during selichot. I think it's the only one that that would actually was a claim by all communities. Tos maat mezerazim koyres bateno arazim. So he says we 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 flowered and and um, carried these these um, cedars which were prepared or ready, standing by ready, but those who, who were ready or those who were engaged or inspired, so they had prepared this already before. That's the, so the Mizerazim are the children of Yaakov. So Tos Mata Mizerazim, they, they left with or they, they, the, they flowered with the, 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 the wood or the lumber of those who had been inspired or, or, or I guess uh, moved uplifted, and, and this became the walls of our home, which is a proverbial reference to the Mishkan that was built for the Jewish people. Darzu, that they were prepared, they were prepared that this should be ready for them before they would come into, they would leave the land of Mitzrayim. Now here's something very interesting. The Krashim for the Mishkan, the words Hakrashim La Mishkan, the boards for the Mishkan, have the numeric equivalent of the words Yainkev Avinu Nota Lahem Arazam B'Mitzrayim. Father Jacob planted for them cedars in Egypt. Who figured this out? The Kliyakar figured it out. And the Kliyakar also figured out that the number, the numeric equivalent of the words Hakrashim La Mishkan is 1095. Which in Hebrew you write out tough, tough, tough is 400. So tough, tough is 800. Resh is 200. Tough, tough, resh. And Tzadik is 95. And he said, because Yaakov said, Bame tis ratze. With what will the Jewish people obtain pardon or obtain God's grace after making the ego? And the answer is, they'll obtain the grace with the Krashim. In other words, with the Mishkan. Now it says Krashim La Mishkan, boards for the Mishkan. What does it mean La Mishkan? It's, it should have said, Vyasisa Krashim Mishkan. The Krashim become the Mishkan. It's not for the Mishkan. So the Erechaim says that the Mishkan proverbially refers to the covering. Like we read in Rashi yesterday, the Ohel is Michse Karalei. The, the covering is called Ohel. So the Mishkan is called the covering. And the question then is, how does the covering stay in place? What enables this sacred area or space to be? And the answer is the walls, because the walls were established, and then the coverings, the tapestries, were draped over them. And that, says the Erechaim, is the meaning of the Asisa HaKrashim La Mishkan. You make the Krashim for the Mishkan, meaning to serve that purpose. And then the Torah starts telling us about the details, that you have Eser Ames, Erech HaKodesh HaEchad, each one of these boards will be 10 amot long, and it will be v'chat amma v'chetzi, an amma and, and, and a half wide ha'amma reicha v'keresh ha'echad, which gives us really an understanding of what the size of the Mishkan was. Now, atzei shitim oimdim, going back to Rashi in the first verse, Rashi gives us a French word, which means standing upright. And he says this means she'yehe eirech ha'kroshem zokuf. He says that the length of the kroshem would be placed upright, Lamaila Bikiris Mishkan. Zakov Lamaila placed upright in the way they grow to form or to, to, to fashion the walls of the Mishkan. Do not have the logs or boards lying one on top of the other, which is the easy way to do it. That's the way they used to build log cabins in this country some, uh, some uh, two centuries ago. And, and the reason is because that's easy. It's very hard to put logs side by side. How will you keep them together? How will you make sure they don't collapse? But if you lay them one on top of the other, well, it's, that's a no-brainer, as they say. But that's not the way the Mishkan could be made. The Mishkan had to have the boards standing upright, shoulder to shoulder, Kedesh al Kedesh. Was, this was one board next to the other. And this has a lot to do with what we learned yesterday, that it has to be placed der gidulam, that when it comes to holiness, we don't lie them on the ground, we don't place them upside down, we, like a lulav, we hold upright, like the esrug hold upright. The boards have to be held upright. That's the way we, we make a, a house for Hashem. And of course, the cups, the menorah's cups are the exception, and we talked about that yesterday. 
So let's talk about the Mishkanic eternity. Let's talk about these walls. And I will just share with you now a fascinating statement which is made by our rabbis, recorded in the Gemara, in the Talmud, on the Sechet Sukkah, page 45, side B. And uh, the learning will continue in the Buri Achomish. The page is Reish Ches, so 218. And this is the 27th entry on Parsha Struma. In the bold print, we have a quote from the Gemara. Shema toimar, lest you say, avad sivrom uvatal sikuyan. Their utilitarian purposes are finished, are gone. Their usefulness has been outlived. The krashim are gone. Talmud leimar, the verse comes along and says, atse shitim, cedar, acacia wood, oimdim. Oimdim means standing. And standing, says the Gemara, euphemistically means sha oimdim la oilam u la olme oilomim. That it remains standing for eternity. Standing for eternity. So, what does this mean? Uvdas nitzchiyusai shal ha mishkan, the eternal nature of the mishkan and its walls. Tizgala la ene kol asid lave will be revealed in the future, a future that is hopefully very, very close by. Kedivre ha medrash, like the words of the medrash, this is found in the teachings that were preserved by the yeshiva of Elio Hanavi, known as Tanad Velio. Rabbeinu Bachaya has much to say about this. And the essential message of the Tanad Velio of our sages is Nitman ha mishkan. The Mishkan was never destroyed. The Mishkan was put away for safekeeping. And after the Mishkan was carefully put away, you should know that it will serve a purpose again. And in the future to come, which is the terminology employed to describe the era of Mashiach, Yahweh HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God will come, the Yishre B'Seichai Kemida Harishayna. God will once again dwell in the walls of the Mishkan. The Mishkan will come back. Its walls will rise again. It stands. It stands for eternity. The Mishkan is going to be put up and the Shekhinah will reside after the third base of Migdash is rebuilt. So we're going to have both a base of Migdash and a, and a Mishkan? You're going to have a base of Migdash and you're going to have a Mishkan. The Korbanot will be brought in the base of Migdash, but the Mishkan will be there. So this sounds pretty strange. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what do I need a Mishkan for? I have a base on Migdash, I have the third base on Migdash. Right. What's going on here? He didn't do it for the first base on Migdash, why do you do it for the third base? He didn't do it for the second base on Migdash. Okay, well that's a... But that's because maybe it would have been destroyed. Yeah. But why do we need it for? The Rebbe asked this very question. Number one, That future era is going to see the rise of the third base on Migdash. Whose spiritual level by far will eclipse the virtue and value of the Mishkan. It'll be much, much more spiritually superior. The level of Shekhinah that will reside in the third Beis Hamikdash will outpace the Mishkan infinitely, even one could say. Shahare Hamishkan, whom I see the Adam. The Mishkan is the work of people, inspired people unique people, special people, prophetic people, people, still people. People who lived and whose bodies were laid to rest many years ago. But with regard to the third Beis Hamikdash, it says, and we read this in our Az Yashir prayer, we just read it a few weeks ago, Migdash Hashem, the Migdash, the sanctuary of God, is koinenu yodecha, your hands will fashion it. You, God, will form it. And this is what is written, that it's banui u meshuchlal yigolav yavi meshamayim. Completed, finished to perfection. It'll arrive from the heaven. As the Gemara in Mesech Sukkah on page 41 says, and as Rashi and Teshus explain over there. So in that case, <laughs> you're going to have a mishkan which people built. Who's going to look at it? Who needs it? We're going to have a base on Migdash that God built. You want a God building or a person building? 
it's self-understood that a Mikdash that God builds is far greater. So, who needs the Shechina in the Mishkan? When you compare that to the amazing, incredible, and extraordinary level of divine presence, that will be residing in the third base of Mikdash. Question two is, so Madua why will the Shekhinah be specifically in the Mishkan? Why not say the first Beis HaMikdash will come back? I mean, if you want to bring back the past, you want to get nostalgic. The Mishkan lasted for a few decades. First Beis HaMikdash for centuries. Second Beis HaMikdash even longer. If, if God has some kind of nostalgia for what was, why the Mishkan? Why not the earlier temples but the Mikdash? So nobody really ever explained this. It's one of these medrashim, you know, is literal, not literal, we don't know. Nobody, no, nobody gave it any kind of meaning, but the Rebbe did. In 1980, the Rebbe delivers this groundbreaking talk on the Mishkan and its eternity. And the Rebbe suggested that the explanation lies in a statement that a rabbi has made, which is recorded in the Gemara in Masechet Bava Metzia, on page 38. And there, the Gemara says, and I quote, Odom Reitzah Bekav Shaloi, a person prefers their own portion, Mitisha Kavim Shachavere, than getting 10 portions from somebody else. This is human nature. If we did it, if we made it, it's ours. If it's ours, we value it. You worked for it, you got it, you value it. It's human nature. Kalaymar, in other words, something that comes your way by virtue of toil and effort expended because you worked for it that's something you value this is this causes a much greater sense of satisfaction and pleasure a much greater sense of fulfillment it's something that's given to you for free if you get it for free you never really appreciate it if you worked for it, you value it. Even if the gift, if you look at valuations in and of themselves, is much more valuable than the thing that you got through your toil and effort. But when you got it through your toil and your effort, you value it more. It's not about the objective value, it's about how valuable it is to me. This is what we call in English something of sentimental value. And sentimental value because, because it has a history, because it was used for something special. Sentimental value can be it's valuable to me. It's not valuable to you. I put the work into it. I made the effort. It's valuable to me. And relating this to our subject at hand, the Beis HaMikdash Ashlishi is going to be a phenomenal Beis HaMikdash. Hands down, no question about it. This is the Mikdash this is the greatest kind of locale housing the presence of God. After all, it's coming from heaven. It's God made. And because it appears from heaven as a gift, as it says, and be revealed and arriving from heaven, it'll give us satisfaction, but not complete satisfaction. We will delight in the third base of Megdash, but something will be missing. Namely, we didn't work for it. We didn't really build this. God built it. Lachain, therefore, Yishra Kadish Baruch Weshkinasi Gamba Mishkan. God will dwell in the Mishkan too. Because the Mishkan represents the hard work, the efforts of the nation, of the people. This was built through the effort, through the, the value, through the Toil and the and the and the and the, and the incredible amount of of commitment invested by the Jewish people. People did this. Why would God do this? Because God wants us to be happy. It's like you want your children to be happy. So you want your children to be happy. You want to give them things as gifts, but you also want them sometimes to work for it. Because when the child will work for it, you'll feel better. And the child maybe is fetching and not happy to work for it. But you, as a parent, know that's what's best for the child. And this will give him the greatest sense of satisfaction. And I'll come back and thank you later. This is the reason. This answers now our second question. Why not the first base of English was also made by people? Second base of English was made by people. The answer is which people? Who built the first base of English? Artisans, craftspeople, 
It was a royal project. It was not Al Yedei Am Yisrael Kuli, not built by all of the Jewish people. Who built the Mishkan? All the people. Who contributed? Everybody. Everybody was involved. And precisely because the Mishkan was built through Nidvei Sehem, Vikoichoi Sehem, through the generosity and the efforts of Kol Yisrael, that's why it will represent the perfection insofar as not only value, objectively speaking, but the value that's felt, the perceived value, the sentimental value of the effort that we made as well. That's the story of the Mishkan. Hashem should help us that the Mishkan should rise again along with the third base on Migdash, Bimheda, will be Amenu Amen.